Hi, my name is Lola Palomo, I'm an art historian and a singer, and today we'll be speaking about the art of the Middle Ages. Now, last week we were speaking about the art of the secular part of the Middle Ages, and today I want to speak about all the artwork that has to do with religion, with Christianity specifically. We'll be focusing on the architecture of the Romanesque and later on the late Gothic styles, and also I'll be speaking about two specific artists that were developing their work in the Middle Ages. So stick around, learn a little bit about architecture of the 11th till the 15th centuries, and see what was going on in the Middle Ages in terms of religious artwork. So I'll see you there. So let's focus on specifically the artwork made for the church in the Middle Ages. And this is a lot of artwork because as I was saying last week, a lot of the world of the Middle Ages had to do with religion. Now, if you remember, I was speaking about how the church and the monasteries were basically with you all your life. So many parts of society had to do with religion. For example, you were born and you were baptized. You got married in the church. You got sick, you would get some kind of herbal help um, from the monastics of the time. If you had no, no money, no, nowhere to eat, uh, monastics could help you to get some food. If there was a uh, death, again, it would go to the church. That was one important part of it. And another thing that you probably have heard of are the Crusades, which was another way, yes, it was also religious, but it's it was a way to uh, ignite the, the economy and to unite Europe in its different parts. So it's strange to use the word Middle Ages because as I said last time, it means it's the middle between the Roman and the Renaissance times. I was thinking about it and maybe we could call these the four or five centuries the feudal times because feudalism and monasticism are the two main concepts that are going to define society of this time. So it's all about the church, it's very much about um, crusades and also pilgrimages. And this is going to be important because we're going to focus on churches. So crusades ignited this fervor for, for religion and pilgrimages or the idea to go and visit. Originally it would have been you had to go to Holy Land, hence the crusades, but then later on there were relics all around Europe and then suddenly there was all these lines of communications made within Europe to make these pilgrimages and that also um, ignited a lot of economy. So you needed a place to stay, you needed the food, you needed uh, a lot of church is made for the guarding of these relics. So let me show you a few pieces of relics so that you can get an idea. Now this image that I was showing you before shows us the three stratifications of society. In this case you have the clergy, the knights, and the peasantry. So the three, I guess, parts of society. You can add to that the nobility. So you had these four styles of living, four classes, and once you were born into one of these, you basically didn't move. So feudalism was a very strict, tight-knit society in which you were born and you, would, you died. Let's focus on a little bit of relics. So what are relics? They are um, pieces of saints that would have been placed in a specific type of box where uh, they would be held and cherished. For example, here you can see, depending on the box, sometimes you see what kind of relic it was. So you can see a hand that was maybe a bone or a hand element of the saint. Maybe you saw a head, there could be a skull in there. If there was a cross, maybe it was a piece of wood that was from the cross. This one here that you're looking at, um, that is said to be a tooth of Mary Magdalene. So the bigger or the more important the saint, the more important your relic was, the more pilgrimages there was going to be to it, the bigger the economy. So you can start to see why religion was important. Yes, to the fervor of the, of the believer, but also to the general uh, society of the, the land. Now, here, now we're gonna talk about vocabulary. Bear with me, you're looking at a few uh, graphs that I got for you to see. Now, 
it's important for me to tell you yes that is Adam Kraft <laughs> he'll be coming soon not now we're starting in the Romanesque Adam Kraft is one of these amazing architects and artists that we'll be talking about later on but not now okay yes thank you all right now Back to our theme. We'll be dividing the, the class today, the lesson, the 10 minute lesson into two parts. So the Romanesque style architecture and the Gothic style architecture. These are the two broad uh, divisions that we have in terms of time. What you're seeing here is a plan of the churches. We cannot go into the earlier churches, which is, for example, Constantine, the basilicas, and the mausoleums that were at the beginning of Christianity, which were not cross-shaped, which were the first uh, churches that were made. And so here you have the plan of the cross. You would have had at the beginning of, or the entrance, what was called the narthex. And before that, in the outskirts was what was called the atrium. Later on in the colonies, you will see this atrium, the area outside the church is going to be very important. But in the churches within Europe, the atrium uh, disappears and the beginning of the church starts at the narthex then you come in and you have the main aisle which is called the nave and then the um, side aisles as well you go along and then you reach the transeptum so that's the area where the cr the cross shape is created so you have a vertical line and a horizontal line meeting and that area is going to divide the second part of the church which is where we have the choir and we have the apse which is basically the most holy part of the church later on we're going to have an ambulatory behind the um, the choir and the apse but not all churches in the earlier times have this area so in a broad sense this is what a church usually looks like now in general terms the romanesque style of architecture is a heavy build basically they are massive walls that are very as if you had a huge piece of stone and you carve the insides out so they are two meter thick walls sometimes very very thick columns and the facades as you can see here are very uh, they are not very decorated you're going to see a lot of brick a lot of small windows and what is called semicircular arches you're not going to see pointed arches so you have barrel vaults, which is just one type of vault that goes straight into the main hallway. Then you're going to have another type of vault, which is called the, the groin vault, which is two. It's as if you had two barrel vaults crossed together. And that is what you're seeing here. That is that S that cross shaped at the top. That's a second type of vault. But usually a lot of the vaults in the Romanesque are going to be barrel vaults, especially during the beginning of the architectural style. And later on at the end of the Romanesque, especially more into the Gothic, you're going to have ribbed vaults, which you can see here. In terms of arches, if they are round, the most probable thing is that it's if most of the arches in a church are rounded, that might indicate that they're more Romanesque. If they're more pointed or to a point, that means they are more towards the Gothic or the late Middle Ages. And now let's look at a tympanum and one of our first artists. His name is Gislebertus, or basically Gilbert. <laughs> Gilbert of Autun. Autun, not sure how to, how to pronounce that. And what you're seeing here is a tympanum or the tympani, which is the outside of the church, a semicircular area and usually this area in the side entrance of the church was used for presenting the last judgment. Now remember there's the saying that the church is the poor man's bible. So all the stories of the church were placed in many parts of the churches in order to uh, educate or enhance the fervor and the faith of those who could not read, which was most of the population. So what you're seeing here is a specific artist called Gislebertus, and we know that he made this because at a certain part of this tympanum, it is signed Gislebertus eh, hoc feci. So Gislebertus, <laughs> Gislebertus hoc feci means Gislebertus made this. And what you're seeing are amazing, elongated, very specific and personalized styles of late Romanesque 
architecture, uh, specifically sculpture or relief sculpture. Another very famous piece of his that you're seeing now is Eve. So as you can see, Eve, Adam and Eve, the story of Adam and Eve must have been made a thousand times in churches throughout Europe. But in this case, what you're seeing is a laid, uh, horizontally laid Eve, uh, probably the first ever Eve that has more of a personal or almost sensual presentation. She is grabbing the apple with one of her hands and she is almost reclining as if she was already uh, doing her penitence for what she is about to do. And this very S-shaped style of her body is rare, if not the only time we see in the Middle Ages that somebody is presenting Eve in this way. Okay, so now that we're talking about Eve, let's go to Adam. So, we're going to change right into our Gothic styles. This is a very short summary of, of the architecture. And we're going to start with Adam Craft. So, Adam Craft, now we've, we've gone from the French style architecture to the uh, German. So, we're in Nuremberg. And what you're looking at here is a self-portrait or a self-sculpture of Adam Craft of the tabernacle that he created for the cathedral or the church of Nuremberg. Now this is very, very rare. So this tabernacle or the place where the Eucharist or the, the holy bread or wafer would have been placed is a small scale church. It's 16 to, no, it's 19 meters high. So it's a church within a church and it's held by three figures, one of them being um, Franz Hals, as you can see. Adam Franz Kraft, sorry, Adam Kraft, I apologize, as you can see here. And he has placed himself as part of the sculpture, which is beyond what we've seen before. So to finish off the architecture and go into the Gothic, the main topic that we have to talk about is light. So towards the end of the Middle Ages, there was this um, theological perspective that God came into uh, into the churches through light so there was going to be more need of light into the churches the romanesque ones were much more um, hidden or there was much more wall than there was stained glass and in the late gothic or the gothic styles which starts let's say the 12th century the late gothic starts to present itself the 1130s 1140s that's when we start to see a development in the styles and the churches start to become much more elongated we start to see a higher higher mm, well, yeah, higher walls because they can be held by flying buttresses. A perfect example of this is Notre Dame. So you have a lot of these flying buttresses that we do have buttresses in the earlier churches, but not like these. So they can sustain the length and the height of these new styles of architecture. And there was this light coming in through the stained glass. So we start to see much more um, intricate and detailed rose windows at the facades. We see a lot more architectural uh, decorations or sculptures and reliefs on the facades. Also, we start to see the choir area and the um, ambulatory, the choir and the ambulatory areas even more developed with smaller chapels around the ambulatories. So basically things got more and more developed towards the end of the, of the Gothic times. So the Gothic style of architecture brought in the theological idea that God was present in light. And so once the light came in, it was God's presence. So you have the King's Chapel in Cambridge, the Cambridge Church, or you have Chartres, or you have the Saint Chapelle. These are perfect examples of late Gothic style architecture where it's just brilliantly amazing and the wealth is also present. Right. This has been the story of Romanesque and Gothic style architecture. I hope you enjoyed this. If you like what you see in this channel, please consider subscribing, liking, sharing the video. This will help me a lot. See you next week with the Renaissance where we begin to see the artists in the flesh and the names of many of the artists that you probably have heard of before. So take care of yourselves and make sure that creativity is part of your day. See you next time.